All right, folks, it's uh, Mark. I should be recording. Yes, I am. I uh, just want to do a quick workshop around uh, solution-focused therapy, not necessarily um, talking specifically about solution-focused therapy as such, but purely talking about some of the techniques uh, from SFT or SFBT, solution-focused brief therapy. Um, I quite like it. It's a, it's a very good therapy in the sense that it's, it's very practical, it's very hands-on, and it's very optimistic. It's uh, based on the fact that we don't have to dwell on problems and keep talking about them and come, you know, come up with things to find out the cause of all these issues and find out what the first time was, blah, blah, blah. It actually says, look, you don't need that in order to create a better future. Now, that is obviously also the biggest critique uh, about or uh, on solution focused brief therapy because some people say, well, it sometimes can be very useful and handy to delve a, bigger, a bit more into problems and origins of issues, et cetera, et cetera. But if you don't have to, uh, I actually quite agree. Why would you want to? So what I'm going to do, uh, I'll be staring at my screen quite often as well. I'm going to run you through uh, a number of techniques that I found really useful in, in my application of solution focused. And I use it quite a bit. Am I an expert? No, definitely not. But I use it quite a bit. Uh, there are some experts out there that I will recommend to you very uh, shortly. Uh, and I find it a very useful tool to get quite far uh, in sessions with clients and I can combine it with other things like you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, a bit of person-centered, a bit of narrative therapy, depending on what's going on and other techniques that might be out there. So bear with me. I'm going to make it uh, as short as possible. Uh, knowing myself, it'll definitely be about half an hour, 40 minutes, I'd say. Um, and we'll see how far we get. All right. Two, I'll actually share my screen with you. And that's the desktop. Yep. Okay, here we go. Now, that should go all right, I hope. Oh, I think so. Now, one guy, and I'll shove that one across. I'll, I'll share two, no, three, maybe four people with you that I find very useful to look at and, and read about and read stuff of when it comes to solution-focused therapy. Uh, one of them is Elliot Connie, and hopefully you see uh, what I'm seeing in front of me on my screen. Uh, Elliot Connie is an American guy uh, who was trained as a counselor and worked with another one of the guys that I'll, I'll talk to, Bill O'Hanlon. And there's another, another one, an English guy, can't think of his name, oh, Chris Iverson, uh, who's also big in solution-focused therapy. Now, Elliot Connie, if you're interested, I'm not going to talk about the guys. It's not that I endorse him or something, but he's got a lot of information, a lot of videos, a lot of written stuff uh, about solution-focused brief therapy. So it's worthwhile, I would say, purely for your own sake, to sign up, put your name and address in there, and you'll be assured uh, to get lots of info about solution-focused brief therapy, which is just handy to have in your own little toolbox. So check him out, Elliot Connie. Now, he came up with a sheet that I'll open up for you. And you should be able to see that now on your screen. Uh, Elliot, Elliot Connie's 101 solution focused questions. Now, they are absolutely useful. So I'll put that up as a recording as well. Uh, not as a recording, as a, as a PDF on uh, Counseling Tutor Mark's uh, workshop and resources page. And I'll put it on EVO Counseling Buddies as well. But this is a very handy sheet with all the types of questions that you could ask of clients that would, if you would follow them and you would follow them um, not in a, in a rote kind of mechanical way, but in a free flow discussion style would make you do an absolutely cracker solution focused session is it's all in there. So again, I suggest get that thing. Um, I'll, I'll put it up download it, use it, print it off, print a couple of copies off. So wherever you are, you can get your hands on a copy, put one on OneDrive, Google Drive, wherever. Uh, you've got all the iCloud, so you got them everywhere. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to this one. Now, a book that I highly recommend, and I'll put it up, is that one. Interviewing for Solutions uh, by the classics, you know, Insu Kimberg, and uh, not Steve DeShazer in this in this book uh, anymore, but Peter De Jong or Peter De Jong. He's, he sounds like he's got a Dutch name. 
Uh, Insul Kimberg is is the lady behind solution focused therapy, together with uh, Steve Shazer, who was her husband. Uh, and that's one you want to get if you want to have the Bible. You can see it on mine. It's got all these little tabs in it. I use them a lot. Um, a third person I think is very handy to read about and do some stuff with is Bill O'Hanlon. And that's I'll have a look. Bill O'Hanlon. Yep, Bill O'Hanlon. Here we go. Now I'll put that one up on the screen. Uh, good old Bill. He trained a lot with Milton Erickson. If you know a little bit about hypnotherapy or a little bit about neurolinguistic programming, then you should know who uh, Milton Erickson is. I might do a workshop on Milton because I like him. Uh, Bill was one of his students and he's got his own uh, way of doing solution focused therapy. So I think he calls it slightly different. Yeah, solution based basics, whatever, possibility therapy, whatever name you want to give him. It's all still very solution focused, so it's good to look at. And the last one, and I'll put that one up there as well, that I'll mention is Scott Miller. Uh, no, not that Scott Miller. Scott Miller, the psychologist. And that's, that's him, Scott B. Miller. Now, if that wants to open up pretty quick. There you go. That's good old Scott in the left-hand corner. Uh, he talks a lot about uh, the ORS and SRS, the outcome rating scale, session rating scale, which is massively interesting uh, material. But he's also very much a solution-focused based therapist. So if you want to look something up, you know, Scott is an interesting guy. So his website, Scott D. Miller. Just type in Scott Miller, psychologist on Google, and you'll definitely come up with something. A uh, very interesting guy, very solution-focused, and uh, lots of good info there. Now, what I've got as well for you, and I'll post that too online, is a sheet or a, a bunch of questions that I made for myself. Uh, I had to do role plays and solution focus uh, for my master's course in counseling. And I didn't want to go into a session without a cheat sheet, so I made myself a cheat sheet. And I've put pretty much everything on there that I think is important to have handy for a solution focused therapy session. So I'll use this one, which I'll also put up on EVO and on Counseling Tutor Mark's workshop and resources page. This is the one I'll actually talk to a little bit when it comes to what are some of the cool techniques that Solution Focus uses. So bear with me, I'll go through them. And I think, yeah, I think that's, that's that. Obviously you've got your learner guide, there's lots of good stuff in there. But those resources that I mentioned now, Elliot Connie, Scott Miller, Bill O'Hanlon, uh, what else did I do? Well, Chris Iverson as well, Chris Iverson. Uh, he's in England, uh, solution focused. And then with the sheets of Elliot Connie, this sheet and your learner guide, you've got plenty of stuff to start working with solution focused and put some good tools in your toolbox. All right. Now, that being said, um, solution focused is, is a fairly easy, it seems easy. I always I said to my tutor, it seems so easy. It's actually not that easy, but it, it has an easy format to it. Uh, there's not a lot of problem talk and, and that's really one of the core things of solution focused therapy uh, obviously you ask the client why they're there and they might share the issue with you and it's okay to ask obviously what the issue is but after that has been said and done after the client has expressed to you what their problem is that's where you leave it uh, you don't really get back to it as much anymore and that's your responsibility as a therapist because a lot of people will go back to what we call problem talk because they just love to talk about their problem and that's very human but not very solution focused so your job as a therapist or as a counselor will be to help people move from that problem talk back to resource talk or to to solution talk and you've got to be sharp because it's very easy to fall back into problem talk mode and, and dive down the rabbit hole out of which there's hardly any return. Okay, now what um, techniques could you use that are really handy? So when you have done all your structuring bits, you know, confidentiality, rapport building, structuring of the session, et cetera, et cetera. The first one I generally ask is a, is a pre-session change question. So the pre-session change question. Um, generally people will make an appointment with you. So between the time that they make the appointment with you and they actually come in, might've been a couple of days, might've been a week or however long. And often the moment people start to make an appointment with you 
or people make you know, often when people make an appointment with you, things start changing. You know, things start to change for them. And to get their brain in the right mode, a good question for you is to ask you know, after you've done your structuring. Uh, so, yeah, you know, Mark, tell me, yeah, you know, since the last time we spoke, or since you've made your appointment, what's been different? Or what has changed since the time you made your appointment and now? What's changed so far? Now you often get weird faces, but yeah, you know, stick to it and say, okay, what's what's beginning to change, or what changes to the problem that we'll discuss? You know, because you haven't discussed the problem yet. What changes to the problem have you been noticing? And let them come up with an answer that you obviously listen carefully to. And that already gives you often good hints on, on where the session could go. You know, and it could be something like, well, I don't feel as bad as I, as I did last week. Uh, and then you can build on that one and say, okay, what's better? You know, so that question could be a good lead-in to, to a nice discussion about what actually practically has changed and that's something you want to remember with uh, with solution focused therapy it's a very practical very behavioral therapy so everything is all is, is about what you can notice what you can taste touch smell feel hear. you know what's different how would you see that it's different how would you know it's different how do you notice the difference between the two how would other people be able to tell you and those are questions you can ask as well but i'll get to those so the whole idea is to say, okay, well, what's different between last time we spoke and now? Yeah, and I actually had a, a client yesterday. Um, I do a bit of work for an employee assistance counselling organisation, so they sent me you know, um, names and numbers of people that have requested a call. And I, I called this lady up after a couple of hours. You know, I needed to make an appointment with her. And she said, oh, it's actually already gone. Yeah, I, I don't need to make the appointment with you anymore because apparently between the time she rang the organization and the time I spoke with her, she was able to sort things out with her GP and someone else and the problem was gone. Now, that happens quite often, not necessarily that it's gone, but things definitely start changing. And you want to make use of that. So pre-session change is an awesome, awesome way to start. Then obviously, the good old question, what brought you here? You know, what seems to be the issue? Now, the one that I put in front of that one, uh, so it's not mentioned here, which I'll, I'll actually put that one in here. So it's, uh, let's call it the best hopes for today. Oops, question. So a really good startup question, and that's what you'll hear Elliot Connie talk about a lot, is what are your best hopes for today? You know, what would you like to get out of today? to make you say that was a cool session or what would have to happen today for you to think that this was a very useful conversation, something like that. Again, it forces people to think about what could be better, you know, what they would like to see happen that makes it better for them. So focus on that one. That's, that's pretty much your, your first question. <clears throat> then you can get on and, and start talking about, okay, what's, what's the issue? So after you've done your pre-session change, after you've done your structuring, pre-session change, you know, you've asked people what their best hopes for today are, or what they'd like to get out of today, so that it would be a, would be a useful conversation. You go, okay, what brought you here? You know, what seems to be the issue? Now let them talk about that a little bit. That's cool. Uh, it's uh, it's good to uh, to allow people to get their problem out. Now scaling is another really cool technique out of solution focused therapy. So scale it. So once people have done their problem talk then a good question for you to ask them could be, okay, now that I've heard your story and obviously do your person-centered reflections every now and then, a bit of summarizing, a bit of reflection of feeling, you know, paraphrasing, whatever. Okay, so now that I've heard your question, dear Mark, you know, on a scale from zero to 10, where zero is not an issue at all and 10 is like it's a massive deal, where would you say your problem sits, you know, your current situation? And let them give a rating. Yeah, that's cool. It gives you a start rating to start working from because ultimately the question will be, you now what can you do to bring it up from, say, a five, if it was a five, to a five and a half, you know, small changes. But we'll get there. So scale that session or scale the problem first. Now, again, Elio Connie talks about that a lot. If you would watch his videos, the next thing to do is resource or problem-free talk. So, again, as I mentioned, stay away from um, continual problem talk as much as you can. So do some resource talk. 
And it could be really simple stuff. It actually seems like a tangent that you're going to do something that's entirely different. But, you know, start talking about, yeah, what are you really good at? What are your hobbies? What do you like to do? What sort of work do you do? What's your family composition? You've got a lot of friends. You know, you can do a bit of self-disclosure. So talk about yourself. You know, and let them answer that. Just let them, let them talk about what's actually working in their life and how things are going for the good. And then ultimately, you know, once they've done their problem talking, you've done a bit of uh, solution or problem free talk, you say, okay, well, instead of the problem that you just described to me, you know, what would you like to have happening instead? That is a good segue, a good bridge to you know, start to see what sort of goals the client would see or the outcomes anyway, the outcomes that they would like to get and that could lead to a strategy towards the outcome and the strategies are the goals. So what would you like to happen instead of feeling depressed? And so, well, I'd like to feel better. Okay. Now, better is obviously not a very tangible, observable thing. But then you can start to ask questions like, okay, well, if you would feel better, yeah, how would you know? How would you know that you're better? What you, would you be doing? What would you be saying? What would other people be saying? You know, how could you notice that you're actually doing better? And that's, that's very solution-focused again. Once people say, okay, I'd like to feel better and I'd like to be rid of this depression or I'd like to feel less anxious, which are great non-solution focused ways of defining an outcome, you say, okay, so if you'd like to feel better, you know, how motivated are you on a scale from zero to 10? Again, a scaling question. And often people will tell you, oh, nine out of 10 or 11 out of 10, you know, because I'm really motivated. But then it's also the question of, well, how confident are you that you can actually pull this off? And you'll find across the board that people are generally less confident that they can do it than they are motivated to do it. And that's cool. And again, I'm not going to go into more depth about that one. There's ways you can get around it. So this is purely a technique, a little training session. So talking about motivation and technique, scale them. Again, write it down. And then you know, you're done with that one. Now, once people have identified their outcome, not their strategies to the outcome, but have identified their outcome, you can start to ask them, like, how would you know that you've been successful at this? How would you know that you've reached that result? And don't make them get away with say, well, I would feel better or you know, life would be rosier because that doesn't mean anything in terms of tangible behavioral results. So keep asking. It's like, how would you know that? You know, what would be different? How would people be different to you? How would another one notice? You know, what would you be doing that you're not doing now? You know, how would you be living? How would you be acting? You know, things that you can see, touch, taste, feel, smell here. Now, you can keep going on that one, but that's just another technique. So ask for tangibles, you know, things that you can grasp, literally nearly grasp so your behavior would change well how so so well i would do more with my hobbies so great what sort of hobbies have you got resource question so well i'd like to do scrapbooking or i'd like to do woodwork or i'd like to do needlework whatever so right and, and you're not doing that as much as you are now so no 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 because i'm too depressed so okay so is it fair to say that if you were less depressed and you were feeling better that you would be taking up needlework again so yep fair chance Great, now you got start of a goal, you know, because that could obviously be a goal. All right, on to, again, this, this all should go pretty free flow and not every session goes free flow, but I'm just following a generic outline. Two types of questions that are really good to ask in a solution-focused therapy session are questions about previous solutions and about exceptions. So whatever problem we are faced with, you know, that might come into your counselling room, Generally, there will have been situations where people have gone through a similar or the same problem before and were able to do something about it. And you want to know because what did they do or what did others do or how did they manage to do things like that? How did they know that was a good step? Again, it's all resources that you can use to put in a goal. And the same with exceptions. You know, often, very often, people will sit in your room with a problem that they did nearly have happened before, but it actually didn't. You know, that's the exception. So where has there been a time or where have there been times that the same problem that you are facing now could have occurred, but it actually didn't. And then 
ask them, you know, what was different then? You know, why didn't it occur or why didn't it occur at all or not in that level of severity as it does now? Yeah, you know, and that's another question you can toss on top of that one. It's like, well, what have you done to prevent it from getting worse now? Another resource question. You say, okay, you say no, your problem is a, is a seven out of 10, so it's pretty serious. How come it's not a nine? Or how come it's not a 10 out of 10? You know, what have you been doing? Again, ask for behavioral aspects, tangibles. What have you been doing that made it not a 10? You know, how, how come it's stuck on a seven and not get any worse? Great questions to ask. So the previous solution and exception questions are ones that you can can flesh out quite a bit. You can spend you know, 10, 15 minutes on it. And don't let clients sort of palm me off and say, oh, I don't know, because that's often an answer you'll get, because generally there is something. And you might have to fish around a bit before you get one. Now, the big one, and I'll go through that one, is obviously the miracle question, the good old miracle question. Um, that's a nice one to ask. I don't like it in its classic format. That's just me. Uh, yeah. Just suppose, you know, Insu Kimberg uh, does a great miracle question because it suited her. Uh, it was her thing. So just suppose that, you know, you go to bed tonight and while you're asleep, this miracle happens. And obviously, because you're asleep, you don't know it happened. But when you wake up, you know, it definitely has happened. How do you know what's different? What's the first thing you notice you know, that you know is different from what's different or what was it today? You know, how do you know something has changed? Don't ask them how they feel because that's a feeling question, but you know, what they notice, what's different. Yeah. That's the way to do it. I generally ask questions along the lines of magic wands. You know, so if I were to have a magic wand and I could wave it around over you right now and all your problems would disappear, you know, how would you notice that a different situation is now in place, you know, that a better situation now is in place? How would you know? How can you tell? How would others react to that? You know, what would they say about you or about the situation? Um, how would you behave differently towards other people? What would you say? You know, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you're walking from you know, the problem description to motivation scale to exceptions and previous solutions to the problem to, well, how would you notice that something's different? You know, it sort of seems to flow quite nicely. And that's what I said. The format is relatively easy. You know, the, the practice of solution focus is not necessarily easy, but the format is relatively easy. Again, you can put a scaling question in. I've put one down. So you know, on a scale from 1 to 10, uh, how close do you feel to this miracle? Let them notice it. And again, the, the rest is all questions, you know. Observations, things that behave, you know, or things or people that behave differently or that show to be differently or that will make you act differently or make other people act, say, things differently use a lot of those and again back to this one lots of questions on you know the preferred future questions and on scaling questions etc etc you know resource talk there's lots of that one yeah what would you consider you know, here what would you notice next what would you consider why would you consider this to be a good thing what difference would it make to your life how would that please you blah de, blah de, blah there's loads of that stuff Okay, right. And now we've gone from pre-session change to introduction, tell me your problem, to resource talk, to what would you like to have happen instead, to how motivated are you, how confident are you, to you know, previous solutions, exceptions, to miracle question or the magic wand that will put you on track for, okay, what's going to be different. Now that all that together while you're listening very attentively can lead into goals, you know, that can lead into you guys doing some goal setting. And you can even already start to preempt on it by saying, look, you know, that miracle, you know, that you've just described to me, where is that already happening even that much, you know, but where is the miracle already happening in your life? You know, how can you see that already taking place even to the, the tiniest degree? Very important, you know, is, and then you can keep on going the same line of questioning. It's like, how has your boss been different or how has your wife or husband been different? Or how have your kids been talking to you differently? It's all about that resource thinking, getting away from the problem. Now, once you've done all that, 
then the goal setting question starts to become a question of, right, what would it take for you to move the tiniest bit up on the scale? You know, so if you've done a problem scaling, so oh, it's a seven, so right, okay, well, how close do you feel to the solution? You know, well, well, it's a three, right. Now, what would need to happen to move you from a three to a three and a half or a four? You know, it's about small steps making big changes. And say, well, what can you do? How can you behave differently? How can you talk differently? How can you live your life differently? So you're moving up on that scale or down the problem scale, if you will. You know, how can we make it a six instead of a seven, et cetera, et cetera. That could also lead to coping questions because you know, often people will not be in a right space straight away. It might take a couple of sessions and say, right, now as we are working on those goals and as we are working towards implementing you know, the miracle and making the miracle work for you and make it reality, how are you going to cope if things don't go well? Now, what do you know you have in place in terms of family, resources, friends, whatever, that you know can help you in times that the miracle is not happening yet and you'd like to feel somewhat better? Get to get them to write some things down, mention some things that you write down and summarize back to them. Still making sense, I hope. Now, a good old closure in the sense of, of a good old solution focused therapy session traditionally was to actually literally take a break and, and you'll find it in this book they still emphasize that taking a break so the therapist would go outside would leave the clients alone for a couple of minutes do some thinking about what was said and that's how they would introduce it then come back and give their findings now you don't have to do that anymore that's not necessary but what you can do is you know give the client feedback and that's always a good one so 45 minutes into an hour session maybe 50 minutes in yeah, it's your time to give them feedback. Now, feedback and complimenting goes together. You know, so, hey, Mark, it was great that you came here today. I've heard a couple of really good things from you. Uh, it seems that you're already moving into the direction of you know, building some solutions to this problem, and I must really commend you on that. You know, sometimes it's tough to find a you know, light at the end of the tunnel, but you seem to have been able to you know, find some good resources here already that you can use or are using, blah, blah, blah. So you complement them, you know, which sort of strengthens their resolve that they can actually do it. And then you suggest what they call the formula first session task. You, know, you can suggest them homework, and that's where Solution Focus is slightly different than others. This is where you can be a little bit directive and, and suggest stuff. Now, they call it usually experiments, and I like that word. I don't, I'll actually change that because experiments is a way nicer word to use that. Whoops, the experiment. So, if you know that taking some exercise that you haven't taken is a great way to get over the lethargy that you've been you know, feeling for so long, then the experiment that you would suggest is say, well, okay, you now we've talked about you know, the, the, the use of doing some exercise. So why don't you, Mark, as an experiment, you know, try and take on at least three walks you know, over the next five days or something, you know, 15 minutes long, and then put in there, notice what's different when you do it and after you've done it. Again, so it's all about behavioral differences. So notice what's different. And you know, let the client give some feedback on that one. So what do you think about that one? Or suggest something else, or you can brainstorm. You know, a couple of steps that they come up with as well. But there's a good one for you uh, to actually put in yourself you know, as an experiment. So if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. You know, just keep working on it. It's an experiment. We'll find out next time if it's worked or not and in what way it did work or didn't work, et cetera, et cetera. And then you know, keep track of the difference and report them back to me next session. That's it. Now, if there's no clear goal, and sometimes that happens in sessions, uh, then just ask them to be observant. So as an experiment, you know, I would like you to observe in your life or work or family how things are going for you and, and to you know, how you would like to keep them happening. You know? So be very observant to little things changing that could point in the direction of the miracle happening, something like that. Now, that's pretty much it. And then you can close off and you know, say good day and uh, move on. That is a very simple but very effective format of a solution focus session. Now, do you have to put everything in there? Nah. Will you put everything in there? Nah, probably not. 
because sometimes you get caught up in the trap of problem talk anyway and it's half an hour problem talk and then you find you got only half an hour left for the rest sometimes people get so caught up in, in actually describing you know better ways of living better ways of doing stuff that it's only about exceptions and previous solutions for one whole session right you know, it doesn't really matter keep in your own mind you know what sort of level you're at and, and where you're at and as long as there's behavioral changes either being observed or being uh, put together as, as pieces of homework or experiments you're doing all right yeah and then leave them with a the homework task and uh, send them off so see if you can follow this one this, i'll leave it at this you know there's there's so much stuff on solution focus so i'll leave it at this one i'll stop sharing so I'll leave it at that for, for this one, but see if you can find your own little cheat sheet. Print mine off. I don't care. I don't have copyright on that one. And, uh, and make that work for you. Because it's very useful to have something handy. I still work with cheat sheets. I love them. Um, but that's about it. Uh, any questions, you know where to find me. Uh, I'll do another one, I think, on acceptance and commitment therapy next week or the week after. Again, purely techniques, not about you know the theory behind or the principles behind, but more on... What sort of tools can you put in your toolbox, like with CBT, you know, your thought records, your decatastrophizing, your cognitive restructuring. Here's a bunch of solution-focused tools that you can put in your toolbox and use them, you know, work them until you start mastering them so you become more proficient with them and that can help you to become more you know, competent at what you're doing anyway. All right, that's it. Have a great day. Speak soon. See ya.